Amen, everyone. Great to see everyone here. Uh, great to have our family uh, who are online, who are uh, watching along with us. And um, super excited as well to be able to uh, dialogue. One of the things that I started doing the last few weeks uh, was being able to worship here in the building, but also being able to respond to people online. I kind of did my thing. I got Tracy Grant saying, thank you, Trey. And uh, being able to see our sister uh, Jane West be able to say good morning to everyone. So it's awesome to be able to connect with our online community as well as those who are physically with us uh, this morning. Uh, I pray a welcome to all of you uh, as we are able to uh, spend time together, uh, being able to get into the Word and spend some time uh, talking about our amazing and great God. You know, um, it's always exciting, guys. Uh, as we gather together and as we have our first few services of the year, uh, and I'm looking forward to it as well. We, um, I'll announce it again at the end, but we're, we're going to be having our kickoff service on Wednesday. Uh, looking forward to that as we talk through some of the details for the year that we're looking forward to. Next week, Sunday, we're going to have our celebration service uh, that we always uh, get, gather together uh, just to be able to have a time of celebrating uh, what God has done. And yet, uh, in the midst of all of this, I know we're all kind of shaking off uh, some of our, our blues from last year. Super grateful that we're able to come and, and be able to meet here. And for those of you who are able to meet here physically, super grateful for you. Uh, I pray that we can continue to give our love and support to our online community as well. Uh, but it's, it's awesome. You know, I wanted to share just some good news. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had an opportunity as a region, not just uh, the, the, the churches here in Ohio, uh, churches here in Kentucky, but all of the Ohio Valley region, uh, all of our small group leaders were able to gather together for a couple of hours uh, yesterday morning just to be able to start the year together. And uh, for those of you who were a part of that and who participated in that, uh, it was super encouraging just to be able to hear not only good news from all of our sister churches uh, in our region, but also to be able to hear kind of their goals and some of their plans for the year 2021. And for me, it's exciting to know that we are a part of a great fellowship. Sometimes when you're just worshiping God at home, uh, watching through your screen, it can feel pretty isolating being a disciple. Even gathering here on, in, in the building on a Sunday morning, sometimes you can feel like, well, is this it? Is this kind of... Uh, the, uh, is this it as far as the disciples that are trying to make the mission move forward? And yet when we gather at times like that, we get, we're able to see that, that God is working miracles all throughout uh, our family of churches. It was so amazing to hear about uh, not only disciples are being made, uh, but marriages uh, coming together, uh, babies being born, to hear about leaders raising up. There's so much, much, much good news. And I'm looking forward to uh, even talking about some things for the leaders meeting um, afterwards t uh, this afternoon, just some of the great plans and things that we just really want everyone here to be a part of. More than anything, guys, we want there to be a reason for celebration. We want there to be a reason of excitement. Amen. I see I got a good morning from my brother Ed Hall. Good morning, bro. Um, and I was going to just share to everyone, I think this is a great time for us to be able to not only, like I shared last week, uh, wrestle through the challenges of last year, but we are able to come together now after experiencing difficulties together. I think it actually increases our bonds of connectivity. It actually strengthens our community. You know, today we're going to be continuing in our passage uh, in Luke 22. So please uh, be turning to Luke 22 uh, in verse 47. And we want to talk about the arrest. You know, I don't know about you, but one of the things that's been really exciting about doing this, uh, this, these lessons uh, on the book of Luke, so many times I'm used to reading these scriptures either in a quiet time or reading these scriptures when I'm studying the Bible with someone, usually the cross with someone. Uh, but it takes a whole different meaning when you're studying it for yourself and you're thinking, man, what message is God trying to communicate to me? Many of us know that this has been an eventful week. One of the things that happened this week uh, that is really important for us here in Louisville is that two of the police officers that were involved uh, with the Breonna Taylor uh, situation that happened last year lost their jobs. They were fired. Uh, and the reason why that is important to us here is, you know, we spent much of the summer in tumult, uh, having not only having rallies on a daily basis, but even having a point in time where there was curfews. And it's amazing sometimes to me how it seems like justice can be so slow, right? 
uh, you know, you think about the situation, and everyone was enraged and incensed about what happened, and you hear in the news, oh, you know, two of the police officers, uh, one of the ones who, who actually, whose bullets actually killed her, the one who actually licensed the, uh, the, the, the search to go to the house, they lost their jobs, right? And yet many people don't know about it because that was announced on Wednesday. And something else happened on Wednesday that really took the headlines for the rest of the week. <laughs> and, and that was us watching our capital in D.C. can be uh, basically raided uh, by these people who in their minds were fighting for the country, and yet that's not the way that it was translated to all of us who watched. And, you know, we watch these things, and you think, what in the world is going on? I remember remarking... Um, so one of my family members, they were saying, oh, you know, we should do this, and, and this should happen, and, and why is this taking so long? And, and, and I said, you know, listen, injustice moves very quickly, but justice does not move quickly. But that doesn't mean that justice doesn't happen. I agree with the, the rallying calls of many protesters when they say, we want, when do we want justice? When do we want it now? And yet, it doesn't always happen right now, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't come through. When we read the scriptures about Jesus' life, one of the most unjust things we've ever seen is the Son of God being arrested for ridiculous reasons. When I think about injustice, when I think about what jumps into my mind as that's an act uh, that is wholly unright, wholly ungodly, wholly unrighteous, uh, I think about being a guard or, or being someone that says, okay, I need you to go and arrest this man. Who is this man? Jesus of Nazareth. For what? Oh, because he wants to overthrow the government. You mean that, that, that Pentecost, that, that, that preacher guy? Him? You want to go arrest him? Yeah, go arrest that guy, you know, and then let's try him and then let's, let's kill him because he's so dangerous. The preacher? Yes. My question is this. We live in a day and age that, believe it or not, is not much different than Jesus' time. As a matter of fact, things really don't shift and change as much as we think they do. We experience or we have seen and witnessed many, at many times, injustice. And yet, how do you respond? My question is, how does Jesus respond to the injustice that he experienced? You know, when I think about Jesus, I think, Jesus has the ability to do some things that we can, that none of us can do, right? I think he mentions in one of the Gospels, you know, can I at once call down a legion of angels uh, to fight my cause? And I think, man, you know, can you imagine being the guy that's bold enough to go and arrest Jesus, and Jesus can unleash a legion of angels, right? He can basically wipe the earth clean, like reset the planet if he wanted to. You're talking about power on top of power, more powerful than anyone that we know, how did he face injustice? How did he get along with it? We live in a day and era where this sense of fighting for justice is stronger than I've ever seen it. It's not enough to pray for our enemies. It's not enough uh, to resist it or to settle in and think and pray that God will do something different. No, we need to take up arms. We need to rise up in our actions and act. Very often, that's the world that we live in today. That's, that's how people feel. And so I want us to read a passage here in Luke chapter 22. Hopefully you guys are already there. And we're going to start off reading in verse 47. Luke 22 in verse 47. This is what the Bible says. While, while he was still speaking, a crowd came out, came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going on, going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. He touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. You know, I read this scripture, and I just started laughing. I think, I said, some, sometimes I think God is amazing. 
God says, this, this is the passage I want you to preach on the 10th of January. At the time, I'm thinking, okay. Had no idea that it would be super apropos uh, to what we've experienced in the last week. I want you to think about this for a second. In Luke 22, we read about the arrest. Uh, this particular passage, this particular passage is in every gospel. Every gospel talks about this. They say, oh, this is one of those events in Jesus' life that you got to know about. That Jesus was in a garden praying, and as he's praying, he was betrayed into a false arrest by one of his best friends. And you think that there'd be this sense, this strong sense of anger at the injustice that Jesus is experiencing. And yet with Christ, what we see is a strength and a resolve to honor God's will. It's intense. You know, and I, I know there's been, any, there's been many, many movies and videos, I'm sure maybe you've seen some of them over the years, that, that, that kind of highlight this. As a matter of fact, most of the time, when I, when I hear this story, people read Matthew's account or Mark's account because it has a little bit more of the verbiage in, in there. Uh, sometimes they're, 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 people look at John's account because they kind of like the intensity uh, of Jesus being on the scene. Uh, and so very often, very rarely do I really hear much about Luke's account and the things that stood out to him that he wanted to highlight when Jesus was brought to an arrest. But this story has many elements in it that are important for us today because we live in a, we live in an era where people really want justice. We live in an era where we see and we sense injustice going around, uh, around us all the time. And there's a great temptation to respond to it in the way that the culture we live in responds to injustice. The question is, how should we respond? I think it's great to be able to look at Jesus, right? And say, well, what can we learn from Jesus? He's the one we're following, right? Maybe if we follow his example, we can get his result. And so I want to talk about this here. Let's talk about what took place so many years ago when Jesus was arrested at his prayer spot at Gethsemane. Point number one, Judas comes to betray. All right, so I want you to think about this. Jesus is praying. It's pretty intense. I mean, he's praying. He's trying to keep his, his friends awake to pray with him because he understands exactly what the hour is. He understands exactly what is happening. That he is just at the very beginning of the passion of Jesus Christ. The passion of Christ doesn't start when he's on the cross. The passion begins at Gethsemane, when he's praying and he's begging God if there's a different way. He gets his heart resolved, and the Bible moves on to say, just at that moment, just at that moment, while he was speaking to the disciples, while he was telling them, guys, you got to stay awake. You know, I know you're tired, but, but this is important. You don't, I, want you, I don't want you to fall into temptation. It says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man was, who was called Jesus, one of the twelve, was leading them. The Bible says in, in Matthew's account that Judas was one of the twelve, and when he arrived with him, there was a large crowd of armed with swords and clubs. John's account says, so Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches and lanterns and weapons. So I want you to imagine this scene. I want you to imagine this situation, right? You go up to pray and, you know, Jesus, I want you to understand, going to meet Jesus, going to encounter Jesus wasn't just simply you you as an individual going to speak to Jesus as an individual. He always roamed around with a group of 12 men, right? So Jesus always walked around with a pack of guys with him. That was not new. But here they're praying. Some of the guys were with him. They're, they're, they're falling asleep. He was in a very vulnerable position. But even in that position, to see one of your friends coming out to you, and yet with him is a group of soldiers, a group of like armed people. They have swords and they have clubs, right? In Jesus' day, they didn't come necessarily with guns. They, they didn't have them back in Jesus' day. But with swords and clubs, they, these guys are like, we're serious. We're ready to do some damage right now. And I don't know what that scene uh, looked like, but I do know that that would have been a time where your heart would have started to beat really, really fast. It would have got really, really scary. Situations like this have the ability to explode quickly. And you're thinking, even as the situation is, is, is beginning to unfold, you're thinking to yourself, okay, what moves do I make? 
What do I do? How do I respond? Because this is dangerous. These guys come up with all these weapons and all these clubs, and they have torches, and they're, they're walking up to Jesus, and, and Jesus is there. He's standing there. He's not running. He's not walking away. He's not thinking, oh, God, what do we do? And he gets ready to meet uh, with Judas. Interestingly enough, the Bible says the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to, Judah, to Judah, Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. He went to kiss him, right? So Judas had arranged to betray Jesus in secret with a kiss. Betrayal in and of itself is painful enough. It's worse when people mask their betrayal with a, with a view, with, with, a, with, a, with a, I guess with a way of trying to look good, right? It's like someone saying, I am simply here to maintain uh, dignity. And yet, the exact same time that I, I, I profess to be maintaining dignity, I'm doing something that's totally unrighteous. It's someone saying, hey, I, I, I'm actually looking out for your best interest. So they look like they're your friend, right? But they're not looking out for your best interest. They're looking out for themselves. Very often, betrayal comes across like this. Because at the end of the day, people that we label enemies are the heroes of their own story. They actually think in their own mind, I'm doing the right thing here. I'm actually the good guy here. And I don't think that Judas was much different. I think he comes to betray Jesus with a kiss. Why would you choose to do it that way? All you do is walk up and say, hey, yep, the guy right there, that's the one. And yet, even in the eyes of the, the guys there, even in the eyes of his other 11 friends, he wanted to look like he was innocent here. I'm the one that's trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to love Jesus like we all profess to do. And what I think is interesting is that evil works in the dark and hiding its intentions. Hiding its intentions. Judas coming to betray Jesus, you can use that as a metaphor for much of the darkness that we see in the world today. People in, in an honest desire in their own mind to do what they think is right, to do what they think uh, is going to make them happy, will hide their evil intentions and mask them in a way that looks good, in a way that sounds good, in a way that stirs hearts and makes people think, yes, I want to be on your side because you're trying to do what's good. What I think is interesting in Luke's account is the Bible says Jesus stops him. He says, wait. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you a train the son of man with a kiss? I love that. Because Judas, Jesus stops him and says, and exposes him. He says, I want you to understand, I know what you're doing. Right? Why is this important for us? Because I believe that we must work to expose evil and bring truth to the light. One of the things that I see in Jesus' life, not just in this particular scene, but in other aspects of his life, and I've actually seen it not just in Jesus' life, but in the lives of the holy men and women in the scriptures, is that they worked to expose evil and bring the truth to the light. That actually is a holy work. To not let lies and deceit and injustice just remain blind, but to wake us up to what's really going on. Like, did you see what just happened? People are like, no, I, what do you mean? I didn't see it. Praise God for those who can do this, who can bring it to light. You got to ask yourself, are you working at exposing evil? You know, being a disciple, guys, is not a job for lazy people. If a person is lazy and says, I just want to live my life and just do my thing, you're not going to be the disciple that God has called you to be. God has called us to do some things. And one of the things he's called us to do is to expose evil. We live in a world today where evil wants to do two things. Either it wants to be masked over as something good, and you hear the rallying cry of, this is good. Things that the scriptures call evil, call wickedness, call iniquity. But the world says it's good. And we should be working to expose what is wrong. Or the world just hides it like it doesn't even happen, like it, it doesn't even exist. And so you call it out, all of a sudden you become enemy number one. You know, I, I laugh when people get upset with us as Christians because we talk about purity. And they say, are you just trying to rally on people who, who live a different way or, or have a different mindset? I said, listen, I'm not rallying about anything. I'm just simply saying that there are things called sin 
and people live in sin and is not right with God. I just want to call out what is the truth. Let's expose the truth. Just because you redefine the truth as being right doesn't make it right. Judas coming to betray Jesus was trying to mask evil for good. Let us not be complicit in that, but let us be a people who expose the truth. What is the truth? The truth is that we live in a world that is abandoning reason, that is abandoning godliness, that is abandoning holiness because it is inconvenient, because it doesn't fit into their narrative. It's important to us to be like Jesus who says, wait a minute, are you trying to betray God with a kiss? Are you trying to betray what's truth with making it look good? That's not acceptable. But look what happens next, right? I think this next thing is pretty intense. It, it says when, the, when Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, in other words, they realized Judas has come forward, he went to do the kiss, Jesus exposes it and says, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? They were like, oh my gosh, these guys are coming to arrest Jesus. Jesus had only talked about it over and over again in his ministry, right? When you go back and look at the scriptures, three times Jesus predicted the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinners. They realized this is happening now. This is the moment. What do we do? And so it says right here, when Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Even at this point, they're asking for permission, right? Like, what should we do? Like, these guys are trying to arrest him. And I'm thinking, okay, I appreciate that. It's 11 of you guys, but this is an attachment of soldiers. This is a huge group of people. You can fight all you want, but you will not win this fight. But that's not how they, that's not what happened. It says, one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear, right? Now, this is what I think is really funny. The, the other Gospels, they really try to keep that on the, on the quiet, right? Like, okay, yeah, one of these guys did that. <laughs> and John comes along and says, no, I'm going to let you know who did it, right? John goes and says, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the, right, the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So, man, okay, wow, we know exactly what happened, right? These guys came up to the disciples and were like, what should we do? Simon Peter grabs his sword and goes to hit this guy. And, you know, was, was, was Peter so well, of, so skilled as a swordsman that he said, okay, I'm just going to take the ear off. That's, that's all I'm going to do. I don't think that's weird. I think he was trying to take this guy's head off, and he's a fisherman, <laughs> right? So this is not his profession. And so he didn't hit the neck, but he just takes the ear off, Right? And the thing about this is it feels so right. It feels so natural. You're coming at me with violence. I'm coming back at you with violence, right? Might, might makes right. If I fight and I fight hard enough and I beat you, then I'm the victor. And I don't even know if Simon and Peter was thinking, well, hey, I'll take this guy's ear off and I'll take another guy's arm and leg or we're going to fight. We know they had swords, right? They actually told Jesus that. What do you think about that situation? What do you think about this situation with these guys who have spent the last three years of their lives learning how to be good preachers, all of a sudden grabbing swords and trying to fight people, trying to fight a detachment of soldiers? We all know what the end of this conflict would have looked like, right? These soldiers would have ripped them to pieces. This wouldn't have been a, a, a very difficult fight. You know, I, I laugh. I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, there's, that, there's these videos you can, you can see on YouTube that'll show like people who get mad at professional uh, boxers or professional MMA fighters. And they say, you're a wimp, you're nothing, you know, I can take you in two rounds or whatever. And there's, there's like videos that they show like the average guy trying to go in and fight someone who this is their profession. This is what they do to make a living. You know how almost all of those fights turn out? Pretty bad right? Somebody who is trained, they know exactly how to throw one punch and to put you out. They're trained to do that. They work hard to do that. They're going to drop you super, super fast. Not a, let alone these guys who have swords and clubs, right? They're going to bash you and cut you apart. And yet, hey, we're going to fight. We're going to defend Jesus, right? It looks so noble. You know, it looks so noble. The question is this, as disciples of Jesus Christ, do we fight violence with violence? Is that what we should do? Should we fight anything with violence? Is that what we're trained to do? This is what I think is really interesting. I, 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 I've actually made a joke to myself, even though it's not funny. 
that the weirdest thing in the world to me is when I watch Christians try to sin. And this is why. Because you, we trained ourselves to be godly. We've trained ourselves to be righteous. So usually when we choose to sin, we're horrible at it. And we, make, we do all kind of dumb stuff. It looks really bad because you're not even good at it. You ever watch somebody who's been a disciple and you ask them a question, they try to lie to you, and you think them, you look at yourself like, you're not even a good liar. Like, you might be able to get away with this, but you suck at lying. I remember, I remember as a non-Christian, man, I, 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 I prided myself on being able to lie so well and so smooth. Like, woo, you, can get, you, you couldn't even tell. Look you straight in the eye, yep, I'm awesome. Yep, I'm righteous, I did this, and I knew doggone well I didn't do that. Then you spend years and decades learning how to not lie, how to be honest, how to be genuine, to speak the truth, right? And then you mess up and you say, well, did you do that? Well, yeah, I think I, I did that. And you're like, what? It's one of the reasons why I see very often when a disciple decides to be immoral, very often I see them, they mess up. They don't know how to protect themselves. They don't know how to do that right. They sin, they, they, they mess up when they sin. They mess up. That's not what you're trained to do. You're following a man who said statements like, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be the children of God. That's the man that they're following. Someone who who's taught you how to be a peacemaker. You're following a man who's, who's taught, turn the right cheek when someone strikes you on the other side. You're following some man, a man who taught those kinds of principles, right? Do not resist an evil man. That's, that's the principles that Christ taught. And now you're going to stand up and try to fight that? Try to do the opposite? You're going to be horrible at it. I love the song, Onward Christian Soldiers Go, but you know, going, marching off to war, but you know, that's not a physical fight. That's a spiritual fight. You're not going to be good at it. You've been training yourself to be godly, holy, righteous, spiritual, to do what God would do. Disciples must not fight the way the world fights. We need to be a stark contrast to the world. We need to show the world the difference that godliness makes, that faith makes. And it's super sad to me that people who profess to believe in Jesus fight like the world. How can I say I believe in Christ when I'm throwing a brick through a window or I'm throwing a Molotov cocktail into a car? You are muddying up the gospel. You're a transgression to their own words. And your witness falls to the ground, faulty, weak, and anemic. We, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we don't fight like the world fights. Why? Because the world is better at it than you are. The world will always win when you fight the way it fights. You might think, well, wow, that, that's pretty stinky. <laughs> well, what should we do? This is my third point. The third point is this. Jesus heals this guy. Jesus says, no more of this. He stops it. He watches this guy get his ear covered. Jesus, I can see Jesus literally moving in the way and says, stop this. What are you doing? Stop it. No more of this. And there's actually more commentary that he, that he says in a minute. But I want you to think about it for a second. Jesus stops the conflict to heal the man's ear. He did exactly what we said. Be a peacemaker because that makes you a child of God. Two people are striking each other with wicked fists. You stop the conflict. People want to get, get mad and argue and fight and start calling each other out of their names or being ungodly. Stop the conflict. Be a peacemaker. Why? Because you won't get godliness out of a fight. Just because you stand over your victim with bloody fists and they're on the ground, just because you won the fight didn't mean that God was honored. Ending a conflict positions you to do what is good. And that's what I love about this here. Jesus stops it, and he turns around, and he heals this guy. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was brought here to arrest Jesus, right, and in the middle of arresting Jesus, a skirmish happens, and my ear gets lobbed off, and then the guy that I'm trying to arrest heals my ear, it would be really hard for me to arrest him. I'm like, okay, uh, do you need some water, Jesus? You know, like, um, <laughs> I mean, like, I, dude, you just flat helped me. That was awesome. You didn't have to do that. I mean, you really didn't have to do that. None of us can do that. But that's amazing to me. 
Can you imagine being Jesus? And you know, you know this is wrong. You know that this is completely bogus. And yet you still say, oh, where's the opportunity to serve? Oh, this guy, he has no ear. Here, let me help you out. And you take the opportunity to serve someone in the middle of being arrested? That sounds crazy, right? But it, to me, it's, it's super, super important because it points us to a great, a great t- principle. What good can you do during a conflict, right? How can you serve others? You know, it's so easy nowadays, if you want to be upset or angry, you can find something to be upset or angry about. It doesn't take a lot of effort, right? You can be upset, you know, with the government and think, I want a bigger stimulus check, you know, or I wanted this, or, you know, we can, we can find things to be upset about. But how amazing is it as disciples of Jesus Christ when we choose to do the good that we can do? There are some people who say, well, you don't understand. The injustice, the injustice in the world, the ungodliness in the world is so great me doing something right is like drop, putting a drop of water in a barn fire, right? It's useless. It means nothing. I've heard people say that. Like, I don't know what to do. It's just, it's just it's too horrible outside. It's just terrible. I just don't know what to do. Where's the thing? I admit, I agree with you. It is terrible. But I want you to understand, to the person that you help, it can mean the whole world. I mean, hey, in the midst of that conflict, the disciples, they didn't end it feeling fired up. I'm sure the guys who arrested him, they didn't end it any more, great, any more godly. But the guy whose ear got healed, he was fired up. The guy whose ear got healed, he felt lifted up. He felt loved. He felt encouraged. Trust me. You want to spend the rest of your life without an ear? I think we live in a time where we can always share the good news. That is an opportunity that we always have to be able to give our own personal testimony. I don't know what God means to you, but for me, this is what God has done in my life. This is how God has changed me. This is how God has blessed me. This is how God has enhanced my life. Here are the sins that Jesus has helped me, to, has helped forgiven me in. Here are the character traits in which God has helped me to grow in. We've got to be at ready to point to the good, right? We've got to be ready to share and help people in need, right? Bring a friend out. How exciting is when you can bring a friend to church, whether it's online or here in, if you're in person, man, do something. But I want to serve, right? Serve someone who's needy, right? Anytime you give a coat or a meal or anything like that to someone who needs it, that's always an encouragement, at least to that person. Call another disciple. You know, I really appreciate uh, Trey coming out here earlier and just talking about how last year was really difficult and how it caused him to even have struggles with his own mental health. He is not alone, by the way. I totally believe that last year, most people in America, I'm willing to say 60 to 70%, struggle with mental illness in some way. Even if it was a mild discouragement or depression, we struggle some way. Listen, we almost feel like we're in solitary in prison at points. Locked into your house, we forget, we lose track of time. What day is it? You know, I mean, that, that'll make anybody go through difficult mental struggle. That's not shameful to go through a, a mental struggle. That, that's just life, because life is tough. Man, call somebody. Encourage somebody. That's something you can do. You can always do that. What was the last thing you put on the phone and just call the disciple and say, hey, I just want to just talk to you. I just want to just tell you I love you. I just want to encourage someone. Right? Give generously. We have the opportunity to give generously. You know, again, our, our, our government has seen fit to give us checks none of us asked for, maybe some of us did, but use it to give generously, serve others. Man, we can always do that in the midst of a conflict. You don't need to feel like you're helpless. You don't need to feel like there's nothing you can do. We can imitate our great Lord. And then finally, Jesus speaks for peace. I want you to think what happened. Jesus took the time in the middle of getting arrested to acknowledge two different groups. So he says here in Luke, he says, stop this, and he, and he goes and he, and he heals, no more of this, and he heals the man's ear, right? Matthew actually records a little bit more of what Jesus said. He says, put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call on my father? And he will not at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? I love this. He goes and he tells the guys, stop. I'm going to tell you why I need you to stop. If I wanted this to stop, I could end it in an instant. And I'm not trying to stop it that way. 
because God's will needs to, needs to prevail here. He rebuked the disciples for violence. He says, guys, trust, trust in God. We have to learn to trust in God and not resort to violence. I want to talk about this. There's a statement that says, if a person commits a violent act and that person is never put in jail or never convicted for that violent act, then that is an injustice. And until that injustice is met, I should just be depressed and discouraged because of what happened. Again, I want justice now. Injustice can happen in a minute, in a second. But justice seems like it's so slow, like a snail. And sometimes it seems like it never comes. We said before, right? Over a year ago, Breonna Taylor shot, killed. It takes a year for the guy to even lose his job. And you can think, what? That's not justice. And here's what I, I, I laugh at. I think, okay, if you live your life squarely in this world, that, true, that axiom could be true. But you got to remember something. God is. And God sees. Do you think that anyone can do something unrighteous or unjust and not face punishment, not experience justice for what's happened? I firmly believe that there is no injustice in this planet that goes unmet. Why? Because I know that God is God, and God is a just God, and God refuses to allow injustice to exist. Well, how can you say that, preacher? Yo, I can point to you, I can show you stories, and I can relate to you. All these different times, scenes where I've seen injustice. And I'm like, you're right. Why? Because we live in a wicked world. We live in a fallen world. If you haven't experienced injustice, I promise you, you will. I promise you. When you fight for it for yourself, I don't know that you ever feel satisfied. Even if you decide to be a vigilante and go and find the person who was unjust to you and you punish them yourself, you take their life themselves, now you've added sin onto your own head and now God has to meet justice on you. We got to be really, really careful. Who do you think is better at punishing his, his creation? You or God? Who do you think is better at meeting out justice? You or God? This is a hard teaching. It's a hard teaching because we live in a world where we see it all the time, right? And justice is not something you have to go searching for to find. It's actually right around us all the time. Do you trust that God will deliver justice? Do you trust that? Because here's the thing that I've seen. I've seen people who say that I trust in God, and yet they don't believe that God will, will, will meet with justice. They don't believe that. I think the world that we live in has a problem of overjustice. You know, someone does something wrong, and we judge a person, we judge people honestly in this world by the worst thing they've ever done. We say, hey, I heard that once you looked at some pornography on, on the internet, so you, that's just who you are. We heard that once you were unfaithful to your wife, your wife, so you're just an unfaithful person. We judge people by the worst thing they've ever done. It, honestly, in, in this lifetime, Man, justice is usually wrong on one side or the other. But God knows what he is doing. God is no fool. God sees it all, and God will deal with it. And he'll deal with it in his time, and he'll deal with it in a way better than we ever could conceive. But you got to trust God. People who aren't big on God, who don't trust God, they are shown, they are shown it to their face when they, when they meet injustice. Because you have, to, you have to make a decision. Am I going to believe that God is in control or not? So Jesus goes and he rebukes the disciples. And he says, guys, what are you doing? Put away your sword. God is going to take care of this. But then he turns to the guys who are arresting him. And he says, listen, in, the, in that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you've come out here with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. But this is all taking place that the writings of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And from this moment on, Jesus experiences the rest of his passion alone. But the thing that blows me away is Jesus reveals to them that what you are doing is unjust and God sees it. What you're doing is wrong and God knows it. You know, a lot of times we think, well, that's not enough. If a person is godless and they do unrighteous things, Knowing that, hearing that God knows it means nothing to them. They're just like, so what? I got away with it. And yet I, 
I don't know if that's entirely true. You know, there's this thing called regret. There's this thing called guilt. Most of us have a functioning thing called a conscience. You can't just do wrong and just, even if you get away with it, even if you, from a worldly point of view, seem to have escaped persecution for it, that it doesn't nag you on a daily basis. It doesn't slowly draw away your life and kill you on the inside. You know, for those of you who like Star Wars, there's this uh, hero, uh, there's, this, there's, this, uh, there's this character in Star Wars, uh, and his name was uh, Senator Palpatine, right? He eventually goes on to become the emperor. And uh, as he, when he's senator, if you're watching the first couple of episodes, he's this normal-looking kind of guy, and, uh, and he gets attacked by the third one, and he gets all messed up, and he starts looking kind of like, like evil and ugly and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and I like that story because there's all this debate about, well, did he always look that way? Did the force lightning cause him to look that way? There's all these different questions. But one of the things that I think is interesting is this. Whatever was eating him inside finally showed itself on the outside. It showed, it showed up. Don't think that people get away with stuff. God is not going to be mocked. He says, listen, this is a time where darkness reigns. That's what Jesus said. And I think, if we're honest, we've seen this in our lives before. You know, if you were like me, locked into, you know, the television screen and, and watching these people like rioting and throwing stuff and, and desecrating our, our capital and doing just foul stuff. I don't even want to mention to you guys. And I think to myself, it seems like a moment when darkness reigns. There's a temptation to get really insecure. There's a temptation to get really fearful. But as I've said before, God we never see an image of God in heaven stressed out, freaked out, worrying, you know, pacing, thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know what's going to happen. We never get a sense of God being like that. Nothing surprises God. And we are the people of God. Yes, we live in this nation, but this is not our first allegiance. Our first allegiance is to Jesus, and our first citizenship is to heaven. We have a king there who no one can overthrow, the last guy who tried that got his tail kicked out of heaven. <laughs> and so we should not be shaken. We live in this world, but we are not a part of this world. It does not move us to become fearful or to walk around doubting or hesitating. This is a time, yes, when darkness reigns. And yet we can call us we can call attention to the injustice and we can remember that God sees it all. Yes, oh yeah, we're trying to figure out who it is and we're looking at pictures and video and we got to figure out who these guys were and we got to arrest them all and some of them are getting away. Listen, nobody's getting away. Did you understand that? You can't do wrong and get away. You can't hide sin and get away. People think God is that stupid. Do you think that you can cheat on your spouse and get away? Do you really believe that? Do you believe you can lie into the government and get away? Do you really believe that? Do you think you can sin against God with, without being noticed? You can't get away from God. His arms are way too long. His eyes are way too wide open. And Jesus is telling them, he says, guys, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know this is wrong. But you know what? God sees it. And God did see it because less, in less than 40 years, their entire nation crumbled apart. The Romans who they were so buddy-buddy up against came in, marched into Jerusalem, and demolished the temple, demolished the wall, dropped that city to nothing. All the Jews that fought against Rome, every single one of them were butchered in the streets. Just like Jesus said, you can't fight these guys. What are you thinking? The world is always stronger than you. They'll always win that fight. And justice was given to them in the swiftest, harshest way possible. What about us? You know, I want to encourage us. This is the time and era, guys, where we need to return to God. We need to have a focus on God. We need to see God more than ever before. Every single day, the media is trying to put in your face, look at this problem, look at this problem, look at this problem. You need to say, look at God. What does God see? What does God think? I've got to be focused on God. If I keep focusing on what the world is focusing on, you know what I become? The world. I've got to focus on God. What does God say about that? How does God feel about that? What does God want me to do? 
I want to encourage you. Revolution is one through submission to God. You want to be a revolutionary like Jesus was? You want to change the world? Then you submit to God. Jesus died on the cross, and it changed the world. Think about that. He submitted to God, and it changed the world. Let us not return wrong for wrong, because when you do that, you're just as wrong as the person that wronged you. Sin over sin doesn't make it better. Does that make sense? You can't sin your way to righteousness. You just can't do it. You can't do it. We don't understand how I've been hurt. You can't sin your way to righteousness. You can't do it. Let us act to do what is good whenever we can. Even in the midst of crisis, man, you find the one good thing you can do, and you do it with all your heart. And finally, guys, let us be a people who calls out injustice no matter where it sets, whether it's in your job, in your home, in the kingdom, wherever it sets, but you call it out so that God's light can be shown and the kingdom can be glorified and to God the glory. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Charlena. She said, preach, preach. <laughs> now I want to share with you guys just a couple of things that I'm looking forward to for this upcoming week. Uh, again, welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone who was able to gather here together uh, with us back in the building. We're praying that as time goes on, more and more of us will be able to gather. We're praying uh, for the vaccination efforts that are going on to allow more and more of us to feel safe and to feel more comfortable being able to come and worship physically. Uh, we're going to be having our leaders meeting today. Uh, it's going to be again at 1230. Uh, I know for many of you, you're thinking, what? I thought we just had one yesterday. Yes, we did. Uh, that was for the region. We want to talk specifically about our plans and especially about some training opportunities that we, we really think will be great uh, this year uh, for our leadership. So many things are new and are changing, and we want everyone to be a part of that victory. For those of you who have a desire to uh, be a part of that, please come on out. Uh, we're going to be again on Zoom. Uh, this Wednesday, we're going to be doing our kickoff uh, midweek service, and as we've done in the past, uh, we usually separate, have a separate time for the sisters and a time for the brothers where we talk about our goals, we talk about our calendar, we talk about the things that we really want to see happen this year. More than anything, guys, we want this to be a year where we collectively return to God and that God will do incredible things among us. Let us not be fatigued by the situation that is among us, right? The pandemic is still alive. It's still around us. It's not over. And yet, this is not a time for us to fall asleep or allow fatigue to, to pull us down. I think God has a vision for a greater tomorrow. And then, this upcoming Sunday, we have our celebration service. Again, we'll be back here in the building. We invite all those who are online to be able to come um, to be able to join us online as well uh, for us to have a great time really celebrating all that God has done and that all God will do in 2021. Uh, with that, we're going to end off here in a word of prayer and that uh, we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you so much again, Lord, for just your incredible example, especially during times of crisis and turmoil. Father, I pray that each and every one of us will gather our own loins, God, uh, to be men and women who stand up to do what is right, that we will stand up for justice in every single way, that we will speak out and we will act in ways uh, that bring and deliver good and righteousness to this world. I pray that you will encourage each and every one of us who are here as we're starting off a new year, Lord. Let 2021 be a new year, a new time, Father, a time that we can uh, revel in, a time that we can be encouraged, strengthened, a time where things can open back up again in a way that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Father, we love you so much. Please continue to bless our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.